Uh, here we are. Uh, so six months ago, I gave a presentation on personas. Uh, it was very much an introduction to personas, uh, why you might use them, what you might use them for, and how you might come up with one. Uh, so uh, one of the things that I committed to tentatively at that time was, was to come up with some personas for OpenStack or to lead an effort to come up with some personas for OpenStack. And uh, through the uh, user committee and the, uh, with some help from the documentation team and some input from some colleagues in Red Hat, I've been putting together some personas, which I'm going to talk to you a little bit about today, and uh, try and get some, some feedback on them and, uh, and some commitment to, uh, to help develop these and, and, and get these actually useful and used within the project going forward. So I, my name is Dave Neary. I work for Red Hat in the Open Source and Standards Group. And uh, I'm Neary D on Twitter if you, want to, um, if you want to praise or criticize my presentation live. I, I, I do like to see the live tweets after. Uh, so a quick recap on what's a persona. I'm not going to go into it for very, very much. Thank you very much. Uh, so the first thing is uh, there are two plurals of persona. Uh, the correct one is persona. Uh, the incorrect one that everybody uses is personas. So just to get that out of the way for the rest of the presentation, I'm going to try and be consistent and use personas. Um, personas and technical background uh, come from, this book is one of the sort of the seminal books that said we should be using personas for designing user interfaces. Alan Cooper's The Inmates Are Running the Asylum. Uh, he claimed, uh, and he was right, that engineers have been writing programs for uh, themselves and not for the people who are eventually going to be using them. So you end up with very complicated user interfaces that expose the intern internal structure of the, the object structure or the, the architecture of the program rather than the way people have a conceptual model of how the thing should work and how the, and how the problems race work. So he argued that coming up with personas and thinking, putting yourself in the place of the users would be a good thing. So what's a persona? Personas have enough detail to make them feel uh, real but they're not actually real. Uh, so you've got a name, a photo, which is you know, um, typically clip art, or not clip art, stock art, um, sort of age, job, family situation, what kind of educational background they have, what kind of skills they're bringing to the situation they're in, and then kind of the distinctive characteristics that make them useful to us uh, as an archetype, uh, a, re a person who represents a group of users that's significant enough that we, we care about them. Uh, so personas help focus debate. They help us uh, figure out what we want to achieve and who. So you get all these kinds of debates uh, around, you know, uh, users need this feature or uh, we have to be at this particular conference and you don't get into the actual specifics of which users need this feature and why. Uh, what's the business case behind it? Randy Bias talked about this a little bit earlier in the, in the community track this morning. What's the business case? What's the actual symptom uh, that people are asking this feature, if it, that leads people to ask for this feature, and can we solve it in a, maybe in a better way? So understanding your users gives you focus and allows you to, allows you, allows you to have better internal discussions. Um, so coming up with a persona, typically you start with interviews. You talk to users, talk to potential users, people in the target audience. Uh, and then based on that kind of large number of interviews, and let me say I've kind of skipped this part, well, we'll get to that. Um, so the, the, in, the users that I'm basing the pers personas on here, we've got a number of data sources that I'm going to go into. A significant number of them are, are the people that we see in the RDO community on the user forum, uh, people we see who are here in the user committee, the user committee survey, and so on. We'll get to some of, the, some of the sources that I've used later. But you start with interviews. You get data. Second, you try and cluster that data to figure out, you know, what are what are the, the kind of the trends that you're seeing? Groups of users that have similar problems. And then you try and figure out whether you have a representative user that you can come up with that has most of those issues and can kind of speak for uh, a group of users. And then you simplify. So the, a user profile can be really, really broad. It can be really specific. And you want to get down and distill that to something that's useful. And you want to distill the number of archetypes. So you might come up with, say, 20 clusters. And you might say, well, actually, you know, the IT director, or sorry, let's say the experienced sysadmin, but who has no cloud experience and wants to learn more about 
uh, cloud because he, he, he maybe wants to become a cloud operator. Um, well, maybe he shares a lot of the same characteristics with the guy who's a student who is kind of looking around at what the hot technologies are and, and decides that cloud is where the career options are, and so he's learning about cloud. Maybe they're coming into the situation with different, maybe different technical uh, levels of expertise, but if we solve the problems that the, the student trying to learn about cloud has, then we solve the problems for the experienced sysadmin who's trying to learn about cloud too. Right, so you try and figure out, is, are there ways that we can merge um, different, use, uh, different uh, personas? And then you've got them, and then how do you use them? Um, so the, the most obvious one is in marketing and promotion. It's getting the word out. It's figuring out what your target audience is and how to reach them and what problems they have that you can potentially solve, so, so speaking in their language. So it's things like what conferences do our audience go to, what publications do they read, uh, what kind of key messages will resonate. The second area where you see people using personas a lot is in documentation, right? Uh, in terms of working out when somebody comes to the website, what kind of use case do they have? Are they looking for, are they looking to ask questions? Are they looking to find an answer to a problem they have? Are they getting there because they're coming into the front page or are they coming through search? And some of the answers to those questions will depend on what type of user they are and, and, and what kind of, um, what their pain points are. Are they coming to the website to download the software, right? The, the, things like that. Uh, so what can I assume about my audience in terms of documentation level? Uh, if I have documentation that has an acronym in it, can I reasonably expect the people who are going to land on that page and have a problem that is solved by that page to understand what the acronym is? Uh, so it focuses, again, it focuses discussion on uh, we need to have more detail in the docs because people don't understand the docs are too uh, technical. That's not actually a useful comment to make. Docs are too technical. Uh, it's, it's they're actually assuming a, a level of knowledge which is not shared by a significant portion of our user base. And here's the portion of our user base we're talking about. Well, that's much more useful. Uh, because it maybe helps you to address the problem in a different way. Rather than modifying the docs you have, maybe you need to write different docs or or maybe you need to structure the documentation differently so, you, so that you've got the fast track for the newer users who don't know the acronyms, and then you've got a, a, like an index with the acronyms that helps them. I mean, I'm using acronyms, it's a bad example. But um, what kind of questions they have, and how do they search for and find docs, right? So what, um, what are the usage patterns that somebody has when they're, when they're coming to your problem, to, to your project to find a, a solution to their problem? Because all documentation is we're helping our users solve problems. Uh, user experience. So uh, in terms of um, the next use for, uh, for um, personas is in being able to say, if you can clearly identify with and empathize with a group of users and better understand their needs, then uh, Randy's just walked in. Uh, so Randy said earlier, he said, you know, we don't want to have people going to the doctor and telling somebody, I need the cure for leprosy. They, you go to the doctor and you say, I've got a sore finger, and then the doctor tells you whether you have leprosy or not. Right? You go, to, you go with, a, with a problem and you get it solved. So user experience is all about understanding your users, empathizing with them, and trying to solve the problems that they have uh, by giving them a better overall experience interacting with your product project. So what are the main tasks that people have? What's, what are the business problems that we need to solve? Do we have different types of users integrating with the same system? And if we do, do we need to maybe expose different interfaces? So uh, one example is the Overt project. We've got a user console, which actually has two uh, views into it. One is for a basic user, which is somebody who has uh, virtual machines that have been created for him, and he can start them, stop them, pause them, snapshot them. Uh, and we've got an advanced user who's a, a kind of somebody like say, a QA test engineer who wants to have a set of templates, and he can spin up multiple copies of, of, of VMs based on the templates. He has a much more ex rich experience. And then you've got the cloud admin. You've got the cloud operator, or the, the, the vert admin, um, who he wants to have access to your storage and network and, uh, and data center structure. So you separate different workflows by identifying the different types of problems that people might have, rather than trying to solve everybody's problems with the same interface. Uh, and in development. Right, so 
we've had a lot of conversations this week about what are the priorities for the project over the next six months. Um, what, uh, what is core? What is, uh, do we need to have AWS uh, compatibility? Um, what, uh, what, what are we gonna have in the next version of Nova, right? Uh, things, things like this. And prioritizing features, uh, prioritizing um, the things that we need to have and to need to, to kind of get in there and make sure that, that they're fully supported and work well out of the box. Uh, first, you need to know what, how people are gonna use the software, right? And to know how people are gonna use the software, you need to have some idea of who they are. So options versus sensible defaults. Are there things that we can remove from the options? Because, well, actually, if you look at things, th this option plus this option plus this option, they don't make sense. And, and maybe it makes better sense to, to have kind of, maybe we can have a config file where somebody really, really needs to change that can change the option there. But let's not expose it in the interface because that complicates things. Let's not have an install process where somebody has to answer 20 questions, 19 of which they don't actually know what the question means. Um, concentrating areas on, 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 on the place where you're gonna get the biggest impact. And to get, to, to get all of that, you need to know your target audience. So the OpenStack user committee definition um, says an OpenStack user may have different roles, consumer, operator, ecosystem partner, distributor, or appliance vendor. Uh, a user can be uh, different types of organizations. Uh, they can be in different market segments, uh, different geographical sec regions. So my comment last time around was you could you know, actually replace this quite easily with everyone. And that would kind of aptly sum summarize it. So it, it makes sense to focus in terms of thinking of the target audience and kind of, so maybe the people in a specific geographical region also belong to a specific, um, a specific, a specific uh, market segment or have a certain risk profile, right? So that we can say, um, organizations of this size in this geographical area are more risk averse, so they're earlier adopters than organizations of this size in this geographical area. So try and, trying to break things up and, and, and focus that target audience to this. So some of the contributing sources, uh, there were some personas that were done by the ALIS Conductor uh, project uh, quite a while ago uh, around their cloud um, personas, the NTT.com security cloud personas. That was a, a group that, I didn't like their characterization, but it was, it was the kind of, um, very specifically in terms of the adoption curve, they had the five, per, uh, the five personas, the controller and the innovator, and the, I can't remember what they were, they were but that was, that was helpful. Uh, IBM Cloud User Roles, so the, the, this is an IBM Cloud paper that was published in ACM uh, two years ago, and they described various user roles. Am I an operator? Am I a deployer? Am I a, a user? And I think, I don't think, that, that, is it, did they say Cloud User? I believe they did. And this is the cloud user was the people who were deploying applications on the cloud. The deployer included things like distributors, but also people who were kind of servicing the clouds. And then the operators were the people who were actually doing day-to-day -day management. And there's obviously some overlap and some interaction between those, but that was useful too. EMC has a uh, user experience blog, which is very helpful that a colleague, uh, Ju Lim, actually, who's here, I think, I hope. Ju, there you are. Um, pointed me to that had some, so this was specifically the three that I saw were the storage admin, the network, network, network admin, and the, the cloud admin. Uh, so EMC obviously have a bias there. Their audience is the, the admins, right? Uh, and then two colleagues, Bruce Reilly, Reeler and Julian from Red Hat uh, were both very helpful. Bruce works for the content management team, so he came up with a set of personas that the content management team were using to kind of focus their discussions around OpenStack docs. And you is part of our user experience team working on, uh, working on Horizon now, is that correct? I believe so. Awesome. And other projects, and Tusker as well, perhaps? Okay, good. Okay, so we get to the meat. And um, the rest of this is, is gonna be presenting the kind of the, the work we've got so far. It's a work in progress. And uh, I need the feedback. So I'll ask for it at the end, but I, I'll ask for it now. As I, I actually want to have this be a little bit, we've got 10 of these, so we've got about three minutes each. Um, so we'll get through them, but the, I want feedback on, is this like completely unuseful? Or is this something that is actually a useful persona to have that that's, uh, uh, kind of correctly reflects what we're seeing? This is a target audience or, or potential target audience for OpenStack, or potential non-audience, right? Because you can also use personas to say, 
this is a type of person which you might superficially think is, is going to be part of our target audience. And in fact, we don't want to target this person. This is not who we're looking for. OK, so the, the main one, Anna, the enterprise admin, so system administrator in a big company. This is like, this is the, the gold standard. This is the people we're tar targeting primarily. A bigger company, several data centers, hundreds of servers, um, perhaps thousands. Um, her legacy infrastructure is mostly VMware. She's got a little bit of Hyper-V and KVM on the host, um, but mostly Windows and Linux guests, probably mostly Windows, uh, running enterprise workloads. Um, her reason for considering uh, infrastructure as a service is, is to give people self-service in terms of the, the kind of the um, outside of the organization. They have a ticketing system where you get requests in, and, and they want to just be able to let people spin up VMs for, for things so that they're a little bit more agile, getting, qu getting going a little bit quicker. Uh, the main things that she's going to need is she needs to make sure that she's picking the right solution. Um, so she's going to want to see people who are happy with whatever she chooses. Right? So she's going to want to see people who are already using this in her use cases. Uh, she wants monitoring, so she really needs to know exactly you know, what the loads are, uh, whether there are VMs that are misbehaving so that she can come in and have a look at what's going on. Um, and some way to, to monitor and manage all of her legacy virtualization and her existing virtualization together. Her, her, her new, if she takes on IAS, she wants to manage something there as well. And she's, she's going to want some kind of a marketplace. She doesn't want to I'm particularly buy into one specific vendor. She wants a way to move around. Uh, so Anna's, uh, I, I would call late majority, uh, a, a, a sort of late majority adopter. She's, she's not going to be one of the people who uh, is running like Bayer or uh, is anybody running Bayer? Anyway, even, even uh, Essex Fulsome Grizzly, she might, now that, now that she's seeing like uh, this big conference as well, there's a lot of user stories, maybe she's going to be considering Havana. Uh, but she deploys basically what her, um, her management chain decides is going to get deployed, right? So she has a significant input into whether this is going to meet the needs that she has, but she actually is not the one who gets to decide what vendor gets, gets chosen. Um, I would say um, uh, freedom to change vendors if she's unhappy with the one she chooses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so she's, she's going to want to, if she goes with one solution and, uh, and two years later decides this is not working for me, there are, there are issues with this, I need to change vendors, and there's nobody else there, you know, she's screwed, and we don't want that. She doesn't want that. She's risk averse. Everybody happy with Anna? Okay. So this is a slide. There is a document, and um, yeah, that would be a useful addition. Uh, do you? So Ju's, Ju's comment was that outside um, the, the VMware Hyper-V KVM comment was that m not many people would have both of them coexisting. Very rarely. Um, I, I, my, my understanding is that about 40 to 50 percent of, of, of people that in, in some of the surveys that I've seen have, have either currently have a dual hypervisor strategy or you know, up to 75 percent plan to have a dual hypervisor strategy. It's, it's kind of a, it's a hedge, right? Okay. So just for the benefit of the cameras, uh, Randy saying in his, his experience, uh, Hyper-V has gotten in because there are, there are Windows loads that you get uh, licensing benefits, licensing discounts if you're running them on Hyper-V over ESX, and that's how Hyper-V is getting in there as a mixed data center running Windows workloads. And also uh, KVM is getting in there partly through 
uh, vendors also using that as leverage to get their, their stuff in there supported on, on, on virtualized. Okay, yeah. So I would argue that this is, this is actually the, the, the kind of the core of our current user base, um, or a significant part of it anyway. Uh, so Simon's the small, medium business admin. He's, he's running in a, an organization with maybe, uh, it's, it's an organization that's, that's got a development aspect to it. So uh, I think the industry section I put him in was construction and they're doing IT systems for managing like things like elevators and uh, aircon and, and, and they wanna provide people who are gonna run the management of a building with a, a kind of a custom vertical solution. And they want, they, they need some kind of uh, elastic infrastructure because they've got a bunch of stuff that's coming up and they need to be able to develop stuff quickly. IT is not a, a value add for them, it's a cost center. And they just need to get going quicker. Uh, probably already using AWS and wants a private infrastructure as a service for development, QA self service, wants to keep some stuff in house. And he needs an easy way to apply security updates. So Simon's uh, big issue is if I'm managing uh, VMs in a cloud, how am I going to? Uh, how am I going to make sure that the stuff I'm delivering to my clients is, you know, has all the updates involved? How do I how do I manage the life cycle, cy life cycle of those things? But Simon's Simon's a good DevOps guy, right? So he he will typically fix that with Puppet or Chef or whatever. Um, and he also needs good monitoring for nodes, quotas, guests. You know, make sure that he knows that he's provisioned correctly and and is managing the life cycle of his data center. So the, the comment is, would uh, one of the key uh, questions for Anna be the ability to upgrade between releases? Um, I can't remember on the document. I'll, I'll get the document up later and you'll see what, like there's, each, each profile has a page and it's got skills, needs, goals, pain points, right? Things like that. Um, yes? Okay. Uh, Dan, the deployer, right? So Dan, uh, is not going to be involved in the day-to-day -day management. He works for a services company. He wants to get OpenStack into clients. He's going out and he's selling so OpenStack. Well, he's selling cloud, right? He's not selling OpenStack. OpenStack is, is just the, the way he's delivering cloud. Um, he is going to look at a lot of technology and he's going to follow where the money is, right? So Dan is the kind of guy who's going to want to see that there's a market for his services and he's going to scale up and he's going to um, uh, scale up a, a, a business offering he or his boss is going to scale up a business offering based on, based on uh, where the market is. Um, he's the guy who's going to architect your cloud. He wants an easy way to spec out a design, uh, get in, get out, deploy it as quickly as possible. Um, he's involved during installation, uh, but not a min. And I would say he's an early majority in that he's not going to get involved at a very early stage in, in, in any project uh, until he's sure that there's going to be some market demand behind it. Uh, Randy, does, are you Dan? You're not done. Uh, Erin, so it's, it works in a bigger organization. She works with the development team. She's the guy, who, she, she's the person who does the deployment of the operations. You can think of her as the deployment team. Um, so Erin's uh, been using a AWS for a long while. She uh, is very familiar with all the continuous integration, continuous deployment tools and workflows that are out there in the industry. And her primary use case is she's taking applications that are developed internally and she's getting them onto the cloud. So she's the kind of the person who's bringing the elastic um, infrastructure and the, that elastic knowledge into uh, an organization. And she's focused on her app. She doesn't really much care what the underlying infrastructure is as long as it supports the pieces that she needs in terms of if she's using a database as a server, if she's got load balancing on there. Um, you know, once, once the subset of features that are available uh, for clouds in general are available, she, she's, I mean, she's just using the, the deployment tools that she, she has always used. She doesn't really care what the infrastructure is. Uh, Diane uh, is uh, developing applications that are gonna specifically going to integrate with OpenStack. She's a, a kind of a value add vendor um, developer. She's uh, selling some kind of uh, hardware or software services, maybe a vertical stack, something that's gonna run a specific uh, cloud deployed service and they wanna sell that into their clients. She cares about the upstream experience. She's, she's very much an API uh, consumer, API and, and command line. Uh, she does care about uh, working well with the OpenStack developers, the core developers, and uh, probably here this week. Um, 
so the comment is that Diane probably cares about SDK, something that's wrapping the APIs in a specific language that she cares about. Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. And her company cares about generating revenues from sales of, you know, from sales of whatever it is her company sells, and OpenStack is just a way to get that, right? So whether it's it's a, a software add-on on top of um, an application that's going to run, like a management application that's going to run on top of OpenStack, or if it's hardware that like OpenStack is integrating well with OpenStack is just a means to sell more hardware. But the, 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 I mean, the money here is in whatever the company is doing as the add-on. Right, so the feedback is she's looking to add business value. Um, well, it, in, in the context of uh, this specifically, and I don't want to get down that rat hole, but uh, let's throw that out there. In the context of specifically the don't compete with your ecosystem debate that's been going on over the last couple of weeks, or you know, it's, we're, going to, we're going to provide open source solutions in, uh, in the context of the OpenStack community for problems that our users are having. Well, then Diane very much does care about where the business value is coming from. If it's coming from hardware, then we're not go never going to compete with hardware. If it's coming from, for example, a management interface, then Diane is going to be worried about whether we're going to have a management interface a year down the line. So, yeah. So the comment is, uh, Diane's going to worry about the downstream. So I, I presume what you mean there is that Diane's company is going to worry about the vendor relationship with the, the company that actually is deploying the OpenStack that she's getting her stuff into. All right, so I'm, I'm just clarifying on what you mean by downstream, because there are two possible. So the customer, customer need and the customer market demand. OK, yeah. OpenStack is a lever to get more sales of whatever it is she's selling. Uh, so Ursula is the university IT director. I, it's an Irish name. Um, it didn't seem weird to me. Anyway, it was, it, it, the alliteration thing came from the initial ones that, uh, that Bruce Reeler did, and I just followed them. Uh, I'm not very good at alliteration. Anyway, um, so we see a lot of people in the academic area uh, or sort of smaller uh, organized, uh, not smaller, uh, relatively uh, large sized organizations, but typically budget constrained on the software and management side. Um, so Ursula is, is managing a, a lot of servers, a lot of EMs, um, uh, but she's and she's managing the kind of the university IT needs, but also providing IT services to staff and students. Um, so she needs that flex flexibility. She needs the, uh, uh, the, the uh, elasticity. Um, and she loves open source because, because she gets the kind of the control, she gets the, the community ecosystem because she's not paying for support, so she wants to kind of get, you know, that close relationship with the developers and software. And she's got the pressure from staff and students to provide the more flexual, uh, flexible self-service type of thing, you know, creating projects because a staff, a student guy wants to run a, no, a student guy, staff member wants to run a, a course on cloud development and he wants every student to have a tenant, right, something like that, and he wants to be able to set that up on his own. Um, Again, she cares about monitoring, she cares about security updates, she cares about managing with her existing uh, infrastructure and her existing applications, but she is much more risk, much less risk averse than, than, than uh, Anna, or Anne, that we saw earlier. Uh, so the question is, the, is the university first because of a reason or because it's targeting that specific sector? So I would say um, the three different profiles that I saw are, are open source organizations, uh, so something like uh, MediaWiki, Wikimedia, um, CERN, and that kind of whole family of organizations, right? A lot of universities using OpenStack. Um, anybody who's got like their primary uh, constraint is going to be budget and manpower, uh, and not necessarily hardware. Um, they, they have the hardware needs, and, and they just need the elastic, uh, the elasticity, and they've got that that open source bias. That's the kind of the the, the essence of what I was trying to get at here. Or is just representative of that. Would HEP and HPC fit into that? Um, perhaps. Uh, HPC. My understanding is that it's got, you know, because of the, uh, okay, so, so something like Excel Cloud would probably, yeah, the INRIA, INRIA project would, would probably fit into, into that kind of 
sector. Yeah, why not? Uh, Brad, the beginner. So Brad is a kind of a synthesis of anybody who's coming to OpenStack because they see a kind of an employment opportunity uh, later on. They want to skill up. They want to get their skills in the cloud. Um, Brad has, you know, he's a Linux user. He's a Linux admin at home, and he just he needs to uh, he needs to get an easy install and set up on his home network, running two or three servers, and uh, he can brush over the details. He just wants to get, you know, figure out what's going on with this cloud thing. Um, and if the install process is he gets to the horizon, he says, okay, what now, right? So he needs to know, he wants, he wants to figure out what's going on and, and understand kind of DevOps workflows and, and all of that kind of thing. So he lacks the knowledge to dig in and debug issues with installation and configuration. He needs to get, like, he needs an easy start uh, quick. Uh, he wants to have kind of a sample app that he can run, like a sample heat template that he can run and see a cloud application running and say, oh, right, I get it now. Uh, Victor, the uh, virtual infrastructure admin. So Victor's a long time VA, a vSphere user, right? I, I, you will notice I am not speaking as, as uh, on behalf of, uh, uh, so I, eh. uh, some of the things that people will tell you is that you shouldn't talk about competitors, but you know, OpenStack is coming into a market where you've got two very dominant players, right? vSphere on the, in the data center and, and AWS uh, in the uh, public cloud. And I think it would be silly of us not to talk about the needs of people who are using those things. Uh, so I've kind of ignored that advice for, for the purposes of this presentation. Victor, yeah. So Victor knows all there is to know about vSphere, right? He's, uh, his company is committed to vSphere. They're a longtime vSphere partner. And they do have changing needs. Uh, he's considering infrastructure as a service, but he wants to figure out how it fits into his existing infrastructure story, right? So am I going to keep using ESX as a hypervisor? Am I going to use the vSphere um, uh, driver for Nova, right? Is that my way to migrate? Or do I, am I going to move to a separate, uh, like add some new hypervisor, new capability that I'm going to just set aside for OpenStack, see how that goes and add a management layer over the top? What are, what, what are the things that are going to solve my pain points? Uh, his pain points are things like capacity planning um, and integrating infrastructure, migrating workloads, right? So, so this is... Uh, Things that are running in VMs, traditional VMs on vSphere, are not going to work without some kind of rethinking on, on infrastructure as a service. It's not. It's, it's, it's actually included in a bunch of them. But this is, uh, it was the one that kind of bubbles to the top for this guy. But Victor is, is kind of, I would say, early majority. He's, he's, uh, he's committed to vSphere, but he, you know, he's, he's already got the virtualization, he's, he's drunk the virtualization Kool-Aid, and he's, he's, he's ready to take that step. He is going to get an infrastructure as a service component. The question is just, how's he going to do it? Um, so I would say he's, he's, he's probably not, risk, uh, he's, he's probably going to be a promising market for, uh, potentially, next career move, yeah. Maybe, maybe looking around and saying, oh, okay, vSphere is kind of, um, a VMware share price is flagging, and, and I need to, I need to diversify, right? I don't, I don't know. I'm, I, I've, I told you I wasn't the, the communications department. Anyway, uh, Dennis, so director of IT, right? He is the guy who is the guy who gets engaged by all the vendors. He talks to his IT staff to figure out what we're going to do. Uh, he's the guy who decides whether we're buying and who we're going to buy from. Uh, but Dennis is really nervous about new technology. He's a late adopter. He's going to need to be brought to that purchase decision by people who are really enthusiastic and expressing that need really clearly internally. So maybe the way to get to Dennis is to, um, uh, to give his IT staff the tools that they need to explain in terms that Dennis understands the value of elastic computing internally in his data center. Uh, one of the things that Dennis uh, maybe doesn't know about is that uh, there are a bunch of people internally using AWS already and sort of consolidated billing. He just sees the invoices coming in. He doesn't know what the hell's going on over there. <laughs> right? So he's excited about technology. I'm just repeating for the, he's looking to OpenStack. Uh, well, he's looking for, He's looking to respond to IT needs, right? That, that's, the, that's the thing, is he's not looking at OpenStack. And that's one of the things that I didn't mention earlier, is, is it's very important when you're coming up to, uh, with personas to avoid that kind of, to not fall into the trap of assuming that the people you're talking about know about your stuff and are excited about it, right? They, they are, they're gonna have a need, and OpenStack may 
respond to that need, and it may be CloudStack, and it may be uh, Eucalyptus, and it may be Open Nebula, and it may be uh, you know, Amazon Web Services, or it may be a kind of a specific product offering, and they don't even see it as OpenStack, they see it as Rackspace Hosted Cloud, hosted cloud right? Or, or Red Hat OpenStack platform, right? Um, so, So Dennis may be a non-goal for some people and a goal for other people. So for example, Lauren may care a lot about Dennis, right? Lauren uh, doing the marketing for the OpenStack Foundation, maybe evangelizing and getting OpenStack, uh, get Mindshare and getting into Analyst Press and getting into kind of, uh, I don't know, Wall Street Journal and, and that level of very high level, the kind of publications that kind of do a very high level treatment of technology trends. Uh, that may be the kinds of things that Dennis is going to be targeting. And, and uh, like uh, Brad doesn't care about that stuff. Brad kind of gets excited about the stuff he sees in tech conferences, right? Uh, so, yes, yeah. There was, there was another hand, was it? Uh, oh, awesome. Am I, wow, I'm two minutes out. Uh, Alan, AWS enthusiast, so, so it's a, unfortunately, we're running out of time. Alan's been working on AWS for years. He's committed to AWS. He's got a bunch of stuff running on there. And then the question for us is, uh, is Alan a goal? He's, he's already got the elastic. Uh, he's, he's sold on that. He doesn't need to be sold on infrastructure as a service, but he's committed to Amazon. So unless we're providing a sort of a private, private option uh, that adds to the value that he's getting from Amazon, or a public option that allows him to move e easily from one to the other, uh, we're missing out on Alan. Is Alan a, a target audience we care about? That's, I, I guess that's, uh, that's one of the topics of discussion that we've had a lot in the community recently. Uh, Walter, the web developer, uh, I added this guy because this is specifically probably a target user for Pass. Um, he's working in an organization where he just he just cares about the code, right? He just cares about his PHP or his Python or his Ruby or whatever it is, um, uh, the CSS, the HTML, the JavaScript. He's like developing web applications, providing an application, running on a middleware, uh, perhaps, and, and he just hands that off to the operations team, right? Um, Walter just needs some information on how to develop his applications in a way that doesn't make it harder for the operations team to scale out. Right? Maybe that's going to come through the operations team. Maybe that's going to come through uh, the DevOps uh, profile that we saw earlier. Or maybe that's something that we can reach. Or maybe uh, we need to figure out you know, how do we convince Walter of the, of the value of using a pass. Right? So again, um, so help. There are a bunch of things in here that, uh, yep. I'm, I'm just done, this is the last slide. There are a bunch of things in here, not last slide, <laughs> I lied, <laughs> uh, that we don't have, right? Something like there's a bunch of people here this week, uh, OpenStack core developers, we haven't even talked about their needs uh, and their pain points. Um, press analyst pundits, right? So that how do we uh, improve the, what, what are the things that those people are looking for and how do we address that audience? Um, distributors product managers, what are the kinds of things that, they, like, these are people who are, in some sense, our gateway to customers, right, gateway to users. They're the people through whom we will be getting uh, feedback. What are their pain, pain points, and how do, we, how do we leverage that audience? Uh, they need polish. Uh, they need to be compared to reality. So the uh, user uh, committee survey has been very useful. Uh, those of you who are in customer-facing roles or in, uh, in market-facing roles, I would love to get your help uh, polishing these and improving them over time. Um, so the integrating the user committee survey results I already talked about. Um, I want to get some feedback in interviews, so I want to compare with, I've got the RDO experience. Uh, ask OpenStack, I'd like to get sort of some help from the OpenStack Foundation. You guys have uh, awesome contacts with uh, key users and, 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 and we, can, we can improve these if we can uh, get them. And perhaps some condensation, right? Maybe, maybe 11 is too many. Uh, Personas are useful when they're used, so any, anybody here who has a use for personas, I would love to hear how useful they are, whether you're using them, and uh, I would love to get your help in promoting inside the open source community that the people who could get value from these are aware of them. All right, so please, help. Um, 
the documentation, I'm, I'm going to put a link, I'm going to put the slides up and the, the link to the, the Google Docs, which has the personas as they are today um, uh, up on the, the presentation, the website. Um, and yeah, go along, read, and, and help out. Thank you. And I have minus four minutes. Minus. <laughs>